So the, uh, the web browser that I'm going to use when I look at your code, when I, and I call HTML code, you need a lot of programmers that say that's not code. But as we talked about last week, we're starting on this journey where you write something down and it doesn't look like what you're going to end up with. You hand it to some piece of software, it gets transformed, in this case it gets rendered. And it looks like something else. That process of writing something down and then having it turn into something else, that's programming at its basic level. And this is a good, gentle introduction to that sort of process. You have to get into that mindset of, well, I don't actually get to see what I'm doing. I have to write down the instructions and then someone else gets to see what I'm doing. So, I'm going to call it code, although the purists in the world are like, no, it's not a programming language, it's a markup. So I'm going to use Firefox. I'm going to use the web browser of Firefox. It's just, you got to land on one. Firefox is a, is a decent, it's getting better. It's been good, it's been bad. Um, Chrome is another web browser. How many people use Chrome? Yeah, Chrome is on the rise. Chrome is, is uh, got Google behind it, and it's doing very well. Another web browser you may have heard of is Internet Explorer. How many people have used Internet Explorer? And if you've had a job, you've used Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer is second now, I think. I think it's first out on the Internet. There are still more Internet Explorers out there. It is the majority of browsers in a corporate environment, because Microsoft gave it away with Windows. Internet Explorer in version 8 and version 9 has become standards compliant. It's actually a very good browser. Internet Explorer version 6 was horrible. Version 7 was better. 8 and 9 are a pretty good browser. There are better debugging tools, there are better programming tools in Chrome and in Firefox. Because if you're a Windows developer, you've got Visual Studio beautiful toolkit in Visual Studio. Um, open source developers didn't have uh, a juggernaut like Visual Studio, and so they built a better one in Firefox. They built a great debugging one. Um, Chrome, Chrome is great. You can do everything we're going to do in Chrome. I'm just choosing to use Firefox. Um, it's kind of like the PCC stuff. So if you do your um, web page writing in Chrome, or you do it in Internet Explorer, that's fine. It just has to work in Firefox. This is one of the things you will do as a web designer, and there are places out there to help you. You have to deal with several different versions of probably six different major browsers, and your HTML and your CSS and your JavaScript has to work in all of them. It has to work in all of them. It's a pain in the patootie. Um, but you have to do it. So there are places on the web, um, like if you use the uh, Adobe Dreamweaver tool, they uh, have a nice little tool where they will take your code and they will render it in all the different browsers for you and you can compare it to them. It's a really cool little device. Um, I forget what they call it. They also have a tool for rendering your code in all the different uh, smartphone browsers. This is just the nature of the business in web design these days. You've got a variety of web browsers, and they all render your HTML and they render your CSS slightly differently. So your web page will look slightly different in different browsers. And depending on your customer, the people you're trying to reach, some browsers may be more important than others. Well, this is an academic environment, so we're focused on standards-based, HTML, that's why we focus on validation. We want your code to match a standard. And we're choosing a version of a web browser that does a decent job of implementing that standard. It has its own problems. And I'm going to just have one web browser. So I'm just letting you know, your code has to validate, it has to work on Firefox. Our standards are pretty low, the bar, the threshold is pretty low. About the only time you'll run into it, later on, one of the assignments for JavaScript is you have to go find some code somewhere and integrate it into your page. I really don't 
look here where you go get it. But not everyone writes standards compliant JavaScript. So inevitably someone finds a piece of JavaScript somewhere that runs on Internet Explorer but won't run on Firefox. You don't get any points for something that doesn't run on Firefox. Again, it's a hassle, but it's part of the business, so I'd like you to get used to it. So get yourself a copy of Firefox. The copy that they have in this campus is, let's see what they got. They've given us 9.0. As you know, these machines get wiped every night and, and they get reset back to whatever they were in the morning. So I'm installing add-ons to Firefox and they'll be gone the next time and I'll have to reinstall them. So um, you'll get to see me install add-ons a couple of times. Firefox and Chrome and um, other browsers like Safari and Internet Explorer all let you put on add-ons. You can add uh, functionality to the web browser. And in, my, in Firefox, you do tools, add-ons. The two add-ons that I added, I did that before class, Firebug, Firebug. It's already built in, so you can see I've already installed Firebug. The version isn't very important. It just has to run on the version of Firefox you're using. It used to be that you were allowed to choose when you upgraded your applications. For Firefox and Chrome, that is no longer true. And in fact, in your web development experience, when you go out and you, if you go to work for Facebook, for example, Facebook decides when they roll, when they upgrade Facebook. People aren't very happy with it, but they're tough. Um, it's the advantage of running a web development environment is that you get to keep your software, you get to fix bugs when you want to. And your customers don't get the option of staying out of date. Having out of date software is a security hazard. It's a terrible thing. IT departments tend to stay on old versions of software too long. And I was, I was the guy who did it. I was an IT manager, so I'm telling you from my own experience, it's easy to stay on old versions. With Chrome and Firefox, you don't get to do that anymore. So, in a couple of months, when we do the same thing, which version of Firefox are we using? It'll probably be 10, and there'll be nothing we can do about it. So you're constantly moving forward. Get used to it. The other add-on that I wanted to get was something called Tilt. This isn't as necessary as Firebug, but it's fun. It's a fun way to see things. So I went here and I, I installed Tilt. When an add-on gets plugged into your browser, uh, usually you have to restart the thing, and then it changes the menu structure of the application. It adds new commands to the menu structure. So in this case, in Firebug, under the Tools menu, I've got the Web Developer sub-menu, and I've got Firebug here. And I turned it on earlier. I, here, I'm going to close it turn it off. So here's my, here's my web page, my very simple web page. And I'm going to go web developer Firebug, open Firebug. Now I've got three different panes. This is a pane, P-A-N-E, -A, a window pane. Um, there's this over up here, which is the original browser window where it's rendering my HTML and my CSS. And down on the left-hand side, there's a window here that lets me look at either the HTML, lets me look at the CSS, lets me look at the scripts, lets me look at the, the DOM, what does DOM stand for? Document. Document. Object model. Object model, yes. And there's also a that thing, which I don't understand. And then there's something here that looks like a code editor. It's showing you the source of code. Over here on the side, it's going to show you additional information about the thing you're pointing at. So we'll see how this window behaves in a minute. There's two easy things you can do with Firebug that are very powerful when you're developing HTML or when you're developing CSS. The first is you can, as you look at your code, here's, I'm expanding that tree. So at the top of the tree is the HTML tag. There's some extra attributes in here we'll talk about. If I open up the root of the tree, I see my head on the one side, and I see my body on the other. 
If I expand out the body, it looks like I've got two layers below that. I've got a div. Inside the div, I've got four other divs. So here are my branches on my tree. And I'm opening them up. This is called code folding. I'm opening the, the code and I'm closing it by clicking on this little X box, or this little plus box. I know I'm going real slow. Please cut me some slack. I hope you're not getting that. You, know, you all seem to be aware. I'm going slow to make sure we're all on the same page. Each time I open this, I get to see what's in there. Firebug automatically closes everything to start. It collapses all of its code. If we look at a, a decent code editor, like for example, Notepad++, Notepad++ is probably your minimum code editor. The materials say Notepad because we can't depend on these machines getting installed with anything in particular. Use Notepad++ if you can. Find a better one if you like it. There are plenty of free ones out there. The essential trick is it should know your code. See down in the left hand corner, it says hypertext markup language file. It knows that I'm looking at HTML and it is, it is making little coloring choices and it's also telling me I know where your tags are. This is really cool. As you type in this kind of editor, it helps you. And a lot of the errors you normally run into, it will find for you. Oh, you don't have a closing tag on that. Yeah, fix this. So, the thing about Notepad++ is it starts with all of the code open. So we can see all of the code here. Because it's a computer, you only see a little window of the code, and it kind of moves around on the file on a big page. And a decent web page these days will be, oh, I don't know, 500 lines long, 1,000 lines long. You get much longer than that, it loads too slow. Our code on this page is only 131 lines long, so it's a relatively simple thing. But still, it's too big to fit in the window, so it's kind of hard to, to maneuver around. I can do the same thing. I can fold this code by clicking on these little minus signs here. So here I've got the same structure. I've got HTML, I've got head, I've got body. I can open up the body and look at it. And I can see that I've got one div at the top. And then under that div, I've got a couple of others. And I can collapse it. So here are my tags. That's a div tag, and it has a name. We won't worry about the difference between a class and an ID, but there are different ways of naming things. Here's my H1 tag. Here's my P tag. I've seen all that before. What is this thing? Anyone? Can anyone tell me what this thing is? It's just a comment, right? It's just a comment. The tag for a comment is left angle bracket exclamation point. Sometimes people call those bangs. I don't know why. But this is a uh, comment, it has a bang dash dash in it. It's always followed at the other end by a dash dash closing bracket. Put lots of comments in here. And in fact, you'll notice that whoever did this, crazy guy who he is, just puts this one thing at the end of the div. And that's one of the ways that this div has a name, has an ID of introduction. So at the closing tag, there's usually a comment that says, this is the closing tag of the introduction div. These divs get to be huge, and there's all sorts of nesting. And it can get, at the bottom of the, of the, um, the, bottom of the file, you can have 10 or 20 closing tags, div closing tags. And it's just, which one is with which? So you'll see people just, that as, as a minimum, just leaving comments around, this is where I'm closing off this div. Anyway, that's an editor. Let's go back to Firebug. In Firebug, I've got exactly the same code, but what's cool about Firebug is that code editor is interacting with the web browser and showing me how it's actually being rendered. So if I want to see what's in this div, this div, I rest my cursor over that div, and it highlights where the web browser is rendering. So in my code, I don't know if you can see it or not, but my introduction div has an H1 in it and a, and a paragraph. If I hover over the div, it shows me 
the entire div. If I hover over the H1, it shows me just the H1, just that text there. If I hover over the paragraph, it shows me just the paragraph. Similarly, as I go down the page, I can highlight other pieces of it. I'm going to have to scroll down here. So now I've got a little form down here. So here I'm hovering over the div for the form. I can open that up. And here's the actual form itself. It's a tiny little form. We'll learn about forms in a couple of weeks. Um, it just has two inputs. It has a text input. And notice as I hover over the text input, it highlights it up there. And it has a little button. So I'm highlighting first the text input tag. Yes, sir? So basically, if you're using Firebug as fast as you're typing or making changes, they can be seen? Well, you can't type in the Firebug. It's not an editor. It's okay. just a display thing. So what you end up doing is doing some edits, throwing it into Firebug and, and playing with it, bringing it back to the editor, back and forth, back and forth. There are some uh, environments like Dreamweaver that try to do simultaneous. In this class, I don't want to see any WYSIWYG stuff. I don't want to see any what you see is what you get. But to help you get across, and, and as you get to the point where you're doing this more and more, you won't need this kind of help until you get into trouble, until there's something really complicated. As you get better at this stuff, you'll be doing this in your head. You'll be visualizing how it's going to end up as you code. But this is a great way to learn HTML because it shows you exactly what you're talking about. Yes, sir, Kate? I've been able to edit HTML with the fire without any issues. Can you save it? Just highlight it and copy it out. Very cool. So uh, let's see. Let's see if we can do that. Very good. Double click on the like, editor tag and change it and renders the page differently. Stuff to like remove sections of what pages I don't like. Very good. Where is that now? So I, I made the change, and then you're saying I can save this? Copy. What I'm saying is after you make a change, they enter uh -huh. in the, the text fields, uh -huh. it renders the page immediately above with your changes, and yep. then you highlight the code down below and you can copy and save that out to the pattern. Very cool. So um, that's an excellent point. Thank you. So you can make changes. Then you'll have to take this code and copy and paste it back into your editor, if I understand it correctly, because I don't see any way of just saving the file. You can also just go up to the Firefox and choose save the page as and then put it in the right location. Yep. It renders a change right then and there. Very cool. And you'll find that you can not only change your HTML to make it work the way you want to, but you can do the same thing with CSS and with JavaScript. The only thing I was trying to get across is that you can't save on top of the file you started with. But this is a very good environment for trying things out and learning. Let's go to the other side of things. The other side of it is if you see something up here, let's close all of our stuff down. So I've closed down the tree. So all of the tree is, we're just showing the HTML tag and everything else is collapsed. Let's say I want to take a look at this and I want to say, what is making? Where is this in my HTML? I put the cursor up in the rendering window. I right mouse click and I use the command inspect element with Firebird. When I do that, when I execute that, it opens up the code down here and highlights where I was. How'd you get that again? I'm sorry. Right. So you find what you're interested in, you hover the cursor over it, then you right mouse click and you use the inspect element with Firebug command. Okay, thanks. And then it moves your window down below to that uh, line of code. As you notice, these sort of things overlap each other. So I'm sitting on this H1. The H1 is inside a div. And that's part of the nested we talked about. So sometimes if you like, go over here, you think, well, what is, what is rendering this thing? 
and you do inspect on that with fire butt, it'll get close. And in fact, it's, it's stick, sticking on that header one. But you're thinking, no, I really want to work on the div that it closes that. So it gets you close, but you may need to maneuver around a little bit. But this is really powerful. So I would really encourage you to go beyond what the materials tell you to do, which they say just work in a notepad editor and, and show it in the browser. I would encourage you to um, download Firebug and get to know it. Now we're not going to spend much time on CSS in the first weeks of the class because I want to switch over to databases in a few minutes. But let's just touch on them a little bit. In this file, like in many of the files you'll see, we've been looking up in the body. If you look up in the head, one of the things you can do in the head, it's not necessarily restricted to the head, but you can define the style sheet right there in the file. It turns out there's at least three different places where you can define styles. And in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about all those different places, and you'll get familiar with Today, however, I've got my styles inside the same file, inside a style tag. Now, if you remember, we had these tags over in the HTML. Remember, we had a body tag. You use exactly the same tags in CSS. So up here, here's the body tag. And look, Notepad++, I've highlighted it down here and it has helpfully highlighted every other instance of that same word somewhere else in the file. So Notepad++ is doing its little best to help you sort this out. <coughs> this is called, what, a selector? This says, this is what I want to add a style to. And in this case, I want to add a style to the entire body. And here's the style I want to use. It says I want the font family to be Arial. This is what's called a font stack. Yes, sir. In the container there, where it says Firefox at the end, uh, second row down, or the second to last row, does that basically say if you were to open up with Firefox, it looks at that and says, oh, this is Firefox, and it ignores everything else that's in that container, basically? Ah, okay. I'll get to that. Thank you. So these things are saying that in any browser, any browser on the planet, I want my body to be an Arial. I want you to use the Arial font. If you don't have an Arial font, then use some sans serif font and figure it out. It's called a font set. Now here's something called a container. Where's the container? The container is there. <coughs> so I've got a div and it's called a container. Its name, its class is called container. Up here I'm saying I want this container to be about 90% of the width of whatever it's inside. I want its background color to be that. We'll learn about these background colors in a little while if you don't already know. I say I want a border around this thing. I want it to be one pixel. I want it to be solid. I want it to be this color. I want some padding. We'll talk about what padding is in a second. And then it says I want this to be a rounded box. I want it to be in a rounded box and I want the curves in the corner to be uh, circles quarter circles that are 25 pixels in radius. This is a CSS3 attribute. And not all browsers know so how is to this, do this. Is this program on or is this Notepad? This is Notepad++. I'm looking at this one file. So as uh, Chris pointed out, I've got this other rule in here that says for Mozilla browsers, I want border radius equal to 25. Eventually, all of the major browsers will be CSS3 compliant. Right now, some of them aren't. And in fact, this code, this doesn't work in IE7. And this box ends up with square points. It's just one example of how you have to look at different browsers and mess with different browsers. So let's go back around. Let's take a look at this container in Firebug, and then we'll stop. Again, like I said, um, every one of these concepts that we're going over today, we're going through it really quickly. We're going to come back around a couple times. So you'll have plenty of time to see it again and to practice. So where was that thing? That was called container. Let's see, I'm going to zoom out. Way out. 
So that container is the big box. And this is called, this is called, not surprisingly, the box model. The CSS, CSS box model. Almost everything on a page, everything in CSS is inside a box. Sometimes, most of the time, that box is invisible. The boxes of all the elements kind of snug up together, and you apply styles to them. Now, in our container, in the style of our container, well, I want to see what, what was the style of our container. So I'm going to use Firebug. I'm going to click on this div here. And on the right-hand side, remember that little window? Firebug has taken my style sheet and is showing you which styles are going to be applied to that container. I've got a background color. I've got a border. This is exactly the same code we just saw. I've got a padding. I've got a border radius. I've got a 90 degree width. It's also showing me, it's highlighting it. It's using false colors. It's highlighting it. And it's giving me this little purple thing here. That little purple thing is the padding. Normally, padding and margin is invisible, but Firebug shows them to you because everybody tries to deal with it. And they're always manipulating padding and margin. So the padding is when you like highlight it, it shows it up like kind of a um, This is about as deep as I want to go. Inside the box, the box itself is often invisible. Yeah. Padding is inside, margin is outside. Okay. I thought it was the CSS, but you'll spend some time here. Notice that when I've got padding, it's on the inside of that um, container. So, um, let's see. Here we can see, uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Take a look at this paragraph tag. Click on the tag. Here's one last thing, and then I'm going to stop. So I'm selecting a paragraph. Now the styles in my file say, well, in my body, I don't really have a paragraph style. Where is it getting its style from? It's inheriting it from the body because it's inside the body. And the other thing that's going on is every browser has a default set of files. If you don't tell it, I want this kind of font and I want this much margin and that sort of thing, it's going to make it up on its own. So I've got some sort of margins up here. Looks to be about, well, I don't know, 10 pixels on the top of the box. Looks like I've got about 10 or 20 pixels below the box. I didn't ask for that. The browser is supplying it by itself. Now, when you find yourself doing professional uh, Java, I'm sorry, HTML and CSS design, most people reset the browser's defaults and throw all that stuff away and build it up from scratch. Now, when you're just doing HTML without any style sheets at all, you're actually using a style sheet. You're using the browser's default style sheet. And it's just built in. Some of the browsers do a good job. Some of the browsers look horrible. Browsers don't used to care about this stuff. Modern browsers tend to render a little differently. If you look at a page in Chrome or Firefox or IE, they all look a little different. That's because the browser default style sheet is slightly different. When you get to the point where you're trying to control everything on the page, you turn off those defaults and you define everything from the ground. Okay, so that's our whirlwind introduction to CSS and Firebug and debugging HTML. So, in your assignment, you're going to take a really ugly piece of HTML. It's poorly formatted, it has ugly conventions in it, it does not validate, and you're going to have to make it all good. At least to the point where it's recognizable and it validates. You can use Firebug to do that. Let's take a uh, five minute break and then we're going to start a whirlwind introduction to databases. Your brain isn't pulled by that one. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to jerk that one.